Good morning, everyone. Uh, this morning I'm talking on late calf perthase disease. Um, it's a common condition of childhood. Um, one that's anyway, so background. This uh, condition was described in 1910 concomitantly by three separate authors, uh, Lega, Carb, and Perthes, in Boston, France, and Germany. And it's primarily described as um, a separate pathology from TB, um, affecting the kids in the pediatric population. So the epidemiology of the condition um, affects males four times as commonly as females. Uh, affects about between one in about 740 to one in 1,000 um, in Australia. Onset is usually between four and eight, and um, children are usually small, thin, and hyperactive with a delayed bone age. It's bilaterally in about 15%. It's normally not symmetric, as in one hip is normally worse than the other. And if it's symmetrical, you have to think of other causes of uh, pathology. There is a significant geographic variation. It's about 1 in 1,200 in the US, 1 in 12,000 in the UK. There have been various disorders which have been associated with it. Um, significantly, low birth weight children, later born children, breech delivery, short stature, and if, people have an if children have had an irritable hip prior to um, the onset of perthes, onset of you know, four to eight years, then it puts them at a higher risk as well. Other factors have been implicated. Is some genetics uh, behind it? In it, there's an eight to twelve percent risk if someone's had a if, if you are if you have perthes, there's an eight to twelve percent risk of the child having perthes. Um, and otherwise, there's been a significant amount of literature about um, coagulation disorders and how they've uh, come about to affect um, perthes disease. So the etiology is largely unknown. Um, genetics play a significant role. Is some evidence to support the theory that there's a type 2 collagen mutation in the Asian population with perthes. And there are large varying studies with regard to thrombophilia. There's no consensus and there's significant conflict in the literature. So I think it's nice to know there is some evidence to support it. There's a study here by Glick or Glick in 1996 which showed that 75% of children with perthes had a coagulation abnormality, predominantly this uh, reduced protein CNS. Um, but this has never been found associated ever since. So the pathogenesis of perthes um, is the three major uh, causes which have been postulated. The first one is microtrauma to retinacular vessels causing ischemia. The second is increased synovial pressure. The third is venous hypertension, secondary to thrombotic occlusion. This is where those theories about uh, thrombophilia come in. So the pathogenesis is Primarily one of avascularity. Uh, you have a dis or there is a disruption of blood supply to the femoral head, then it, you get articular changes in the uh, middle and deep layers of the articular cartilage. So these are uh, these layers sort of in here, so the intermediate and deep zones, and you get separation of cartilage from underlying bone. And you just get an invasion of vascular vascularity into the cartilage, and this goes through the epiphysis and the and the physis. So in terms of what actually happens at, at the growth centres, um, you have disruption of the blood supply. This causes an area of central uh, necrosis. You have subchondral fracture, areas of trabecular compression, and the cartilage actually separates off from overlying, the underlying bone. This compresses centrally, and you get re revascularization and ossification, and then slowly over time you get resorption and remodeling that you end up with deformity of the physis. Uh, so clinical features, boys affect more than girls, it's by that from 10 to 15% as previously mentioned. It's got an insidious onset, typically presenting with pain and a limp in childhood. Uh, there is a reduced range of motion clinically initially due to the synovitis, which uh, precedes that deformity, which gives rise to, to the later uh, reduced mobility. And maybe a Sign which is positive. There's also likely to be loss of abduction, internal rotation, there can be flexion and adduction contractures, and a limb length discrepancy as well. So, differentials when you see a child with a limb and you're thinking about perthes, chronic infection, uh, especially in our sort of population that we're seeing here with uh, people from Middle East and migrant populations of TB, 
AVN, multiple epiphyseal dysplasia, or spondyl epiphyseal dysplasia, hypothyroidism, and tumors, and OCD as well can be thought of. The major differential with MED is MED is normally bilateral and symmetrical, with acetabular involvement, and there's metaphyseal cysts. So investigations is a baseline. Uh, blood should be done to rule out other causes, such as hypothyroidism or infection. X-rays uh, routinely uh, the standard of treatment of di diagnosis and management. MRI has been useful in determining uh, plasial vascularity prior to prior to X-ray changes, and then arthrog arthrography has been used to determine you know, actual sphericity of the of the head and congruence. But MRI is Largely unknown, there aren't any real grading or staging systems which have its utility and no real prognostic, uh, there's no real prognostic evidence for it. So it's useful for that initial diagnosis if you're not sure what's going on, but it's got limited evidence for its use beyond that. And all the studies that have been done use, um, use X-ray. So I've gone through this talk trying to sort of plan for the uh, exam, and trying to think about what they're going to ask. And I think the major bulk of her phase is actually with the classifications prognosis of it. Little, there's not a whole heap known as a treatment. There's so much controversy with treatment that I think it's unlikely that they'll ask me a whole heap about you know, different evidence for different treatments. So I think the majority of it's this classification. So the various classification systems that have been used. The first one is uh, Waldenstrom, which is a chronological classification. There are others such as the Catterall, Salter and Herrings, which are the, classify the extent of disease and give some idea as to natural history. And then the most uh, commonly used one for outcome and, for, and guiding you know, the natural history is the Stolberg criteria. So I'll go through each of them. So Waldenstrom's classification is useful in that it guides, uh, guides you when you actually see a patient. So it's classified into four stages. So you have an initial phase where you have increased radio density and you have this Waldenstrom sign which you get subtle subluxation via medial articular growth. And you have some subchondral fractures. The second stage is where you get fragmentation. This is where patients typically present as this painful stage. Then you slowly get reossification, and then stage four is where it's healed. So this is the big one where people sort of present. Uh, but it's difficult to know exactly how much fragmentation is going to progress to be reossified and how much deformity is going to result from it. So it's useful for predicting sort of rough timelines, but it doesn't give you a proper prognosticator as to uh, what deformity is going to result. Um, the next classification is this uh, catterall classification. So this utilised AP and lateral x-rays to determine the percentage of the head involved. So if you look at the next slide, this is sort of an AP and a lateral and you see I'm taking a combined percentage of how much head's involved. They talk about um, four groups, so it's pretty easy to remember, between 25 to 100 percent of, 25 to 75 percent involved, basically in terms of uh, progressive Involvement of the of the head, and significantly, uh, it ranges from only part of the head with less than 25 to being total epiphyseal collapse and deformity. And they associate group three and four with group four outcomes. So on the AP and lateral films, you can see here um, less than 25 percent collapse. Oh, it's in the word but collapse. <laughs> collapse. Um, 50, 75, and then greater than 75 percent. Um, also, significantly in that paper, Carroll described four head at risk signs, which were associated uh, with poor outcomes. So, things to, to know from this paper is something called a gauge, gauge sign, which is this osteoporotic V, which is lateral to the epiphysis. And the other thing is uh, lateral subluxation, and they talk about this with regard to the inframedial joint space as being widened. So, these are things to think about. The other thing is this epiphyseal angle. So if the, if the transverse, if the epiphysis is transverse, then the theory is that it undergoes less shearing stress and it has a better outcome than if it's a vertical epiphysis because there's a child walking and their thighs is undergoing a shearing force and therefore places increased risk on, on the head. The other major classification that's uh, been used is the herring classification and this gives rise to the idea of a lateral pillar. So that breaks down the head into three pillars. So there's a central pillar, which is about 50%, a lateral, which is 25%, and a medial, which is 25%. And the theory is that this lateral patella shield, shields the um, physis from further deformity and injury. Um, 
It then groups them into A, B, and C. So group A is where there's uh, no lateral pillar collapse. Group B is where it's uh, less than 50%, and group C is where it's greater than uh, greater than 75 percent. The difficulty with this uh, grading system is that you don't know at the time of assessment, which is a fragmentation stage, as to whether or not an A will become a B or a B will become a C. So that's the major major problem with this uh, grading system. Um, they found overall that these group C patients, so these are the ones that have almost a complete lateral lateral pillar collapse, do very badly. Um, they also found no real uh, differences between uh, bracing and range of motion and no treatment, uh, no differences with treatment below eight years of old. The other classification that's worth knowing is a little bit about is the Salter and Thompson. But again, it's similar to the Catterall classification, uh, so the herring, cat, uh, herring and Catterall classifications because it's talking about the lateral margin and this lateral, lateral pillar which shields the physis from stress. And the primary thing to talk about here is the subchondral fracture um, which guides how much uh, is going, of the physis is going to resorb. So the natural history of Perthes, is the big thing that patients want to know and parents want to know is look at the child's risk of having ongoing problems and the risk of developing secondary osteoporosis. So the fact, key factors are basically the biggest one is the age at onset um, is that guides essentially what's going to happen to the child. I'll talk about the prognosis more in a few slides. But ch children less than six generally do well. Children over six at presentation generally do very poorly. Um, if they're female, the extent of the disease and the extent of their involvement in the fragmentation stage in the lateral pillar are all prognosticators. Um, if they've got two head at wrist signs, so there's a um, gauge sign, lateral subluxation, um, etc. Uh, if they have a premature fasciole closure, if they have deformity at skeletal maturity, and the amount of range of motion they've got in the weight all can be you know, risk, are all risk factors for secondary osteoporosis. And overall, the prevalence of osteoporosis is about 10 times the general population. The largest uh, series that's been reported on with respect to the natural history is the Stuhlberg, um, Stuhlberg series, where they actually looked at patients radiographic signs of osteoporosis at 40 years of follow-up. So this is the largest series that's been done, the best one for giving patients a guide at skeletal maturity as to what their long-term prognosis is. And all their children should be followed up to skeletal maturity. And the big ones are, once you're getting into threes, fours and fives, you get a very, very much worse prognosis. So 40, you know, 40 years post uh, per phase, this is when people are into their mid to late 40s, significant number of them, so over half will have significant radiographic signs of uh, arthritis. And this really comes down to the fact that you're having a non-spherical head in a, in a, in a non-spherical joint. So the joint is incongruent and that's what's causing the, the uh, that's what's causing the de uh, degeneration. So the management principles um, and prevent the head deformity and secondary arthrosis without um, interfering with the child's development and learning. So the principles are restore and maintain, maintain range of motion, prevent subluxation, reduce and contain the head, relieve symptoms, and then reduce the force across the hip and then allow the femoral head to remodel. So I'll quickly go through the surgical and non-surgical management options and then talk about the evidence for them. So over 60% of them do not 60% of patients don't require any form of operative intervention. You manage with observation, activity restriction, partial weight bearing traction, physiotherapy, um, and bracing. So the indications are typically less than eight years of age in the lateral pillar A. The use of bracing and casting is controversial. Uh, there's very little evidence for it. But the, theory, the theory does hold a lot of weight in some people's minds. So there are things called Petri casts, Abduction, abduction cast where there's both legs are in plaster and the broomstick which goes across to hold the legs in abduction. The theory is that it uh, contains the femoral head within the acetabulum and seats it deeply to shield that lateral um, lateral pillar. And then there are these braces which are Scottish right orthosis, which 
have these two cuffs which go around the thighs and then you have a, a bar in the middle. Um, this allows the child to walk and the bar slides sort of backwards and forwards to allow them to ambulate a bit more freely. And there are operative options. So proximal femoral, femoral varus osteotomy has been is one of the one of the two major uh, treatment modalities. The other is um, pelvic osteotomies, which I'll talk about in a moment. The rationale is that it rotates the femoral head. You can see, so the intern from residence, you can see here that the uh, osteotomy is made in the subtrochanteric region and the femoral head is rotated around and reduced back into the acetabulum. This maintains sphericity and allows it to um, become congruent. The head then remodels and allows it to reform. So, oh, no, so the pelvic tool is very Yeah, true. But you can see Shenton's line is way up here in this film, and it's more or less restored down here. Yeah. But there is a significant amount of pelvic tilt. Yeah, I agree. There are difficulties though, but one of the one of the other theories is um, with the with the osteotomy is because you're cutting the bone, it's essentially uh, relieving the venous hypertension and and uh, doing a Farage procedure, which is easier than AVN. So that's one of the theories of, as to why it works. The disadvantages is uh, that uh, you can get a limb length discrepancy, you get coxivera, trochanteric overgrowth. You often have to remove the metal and then you get a difficult total hip replacement later on down the track when you have to do it. Then on the other side, they said there are pelvic osteotomies, there are multiple that have been described. So salters of triples and nominates, they use permanence. Um, the theory is that you redirect the acetabulum to provide better coverage for the anterolateral femoral head, and you can combine these with a various proximal osteotomy. The prerequisite, as we just talked about, is that um, you have almost full range of motion, and then you have reasonable congruence on abduction or extra and full abduction to confirm that there's containment, and this should be done ideally at the fragmentation stage. The disadvantages of it is that it increases lateral head pressure, and uh, it's technically difficult, and you get leg lengthening as well. So. For the exam, I think I was going to base my treatment mainly upon age. Um, so if the child's less than six, you can count to the patients that most of them do very well. Most of them achieve still go one or two at maturity. Up to 80% are non-operative and with symptomatic management only. There's a study recently by uh, WIG uh, which showed that even with greater than 50% head involvement, um, they still produce the still go one or two um, at five year follow-up. And there's no statistical difference, no statistical difference in treatment. So it's physio, Scottish right orthosis, or femoral osteotomy, they're all about 50% um, effective. So there's no statistical difference. No statistical difference in treatment. And so there are no real predictive factors for identifying poor outcomes to identify in that study. In the age group that's greater than six, this is where the controversy really lies. Um, there have been a few studies recently. So the Perthy study group trial, which was a large one, um, done by the J which was published in the JVJS in 2004. Um, again, it showed there's no statistically significant difference between surgery and non-surgical treatment. However, uh, the problem was, and it's been commented that the study was underpowered to show results, is there were differences in rates of outcome, but none of them reached statistical significance. Um, this one compared to the trial before mentioned by WIG, um, there's no uh, stratification to that six to eight year old uh, bracket and the follow-up points were different, which makes it hard to compare the two. Um, in the trial by Wigan, Wigan Al, um, the femoral varus osteotomy had a better, better radiographic result at five years versus bracing on physio. Um, but again, it was difficult to quantify that against that other study. And you can see here, um, none of this really reached statistical, statistical uh, significance, which makes all this very, very much just a moot point, but uh, there's no real guidance from any of these studies, which are the most recent ones. Um, that's the Stilberg 1 and 2. Uh, so the patients that uh, result in the Stilberg 1 and 2 in that study, in the Perth study group, um, none of them just statistically significant, but this 62% of the various proximal osteotomy um, really suggests that the study should have been bigger so that we were allowed to so it could have actually been powered appropriately to see, see a difference. 
This study here was published last year, um, which is a meta-analysis of all the papers previously. Um, so in the 23 studies, 1,200 patients, which is very large. Uh, and less, less than six-year-olds had a good result regardless of treatment. Greater, greater than six-year-olds um, had a good uh, outcome at either pelvic or femoral surgery, um, but only if they were lateral pillar B or C. So for those lateral pillar A's, it's definitely not operative, but for B and C's, it is an argument for operating on them. However, there's no real evidence to suggest whether or not you should do a proximal femoral or a pelvic osteotomy in this population. Okay, so then there's other treatments, and this is really getting into sort of more salvage scenarios. There's shelf acetabulopathy, which is something I think you have to have some idea about what it is. But basically, the idea is that it just covers that anterolateral head and provides extra support. Um, there's limited evidence in it. But this is for that older population group. Uh, has been proposed to be used in younger patients. Um, it's got three beneficial effects. The first is that it stimulates this lateral acetabular growth, which prevents sub subluxation, and the, and the, the shelf resolves after femoral fib patients. Other things that have been described in the past um, is this thing, so this is a hinged external fixator, uh, which puts traction upon the joint. Theoretically, to reduce the joint pressure, joint reaction force. Um, this widens and unloads the joint and it reduces on the femoral head and allows repair of the articular cartilage. And it's applied for four to five months and it protects head, uh, the head only in the short term. The difficulty is, as soon as you take it off, the head fails and the, the head just goes back to how it was. So there's no real evidence for it. There's some uh, evidence, however, for a femoral valgus osteotomy. This is in the late stages and really salvage scenario. And there's you know, a couple of studies out there which have stated there's good outcomes in five to seven years. So uh, other procedures that have been described are chylectomy, uh, GT transfer, arthrodesis, and arthroplasty options, all in the salvage scenario. This all later on down the track. So in summary, it's a common condition. It's an unknown etiology, largely based around the avascularity theory. There are multiple classifications. It's only really predictive in the early stages of prognosis. The lateral pillar classification is the most useful in determining treatment. However, it's not known when to apply it because you don't know if the B is going to become a C or an A from the B or a C, so it becomes very difficult in that regard. There's not the treatment is largely dictated by age of presentation, so less than six year olds should all be non operative. Greater than six year olds, there is an argument to operate on them if it's either lateral pillar B or C. Uh, however, there's no evidence to support whether or not it's a, on the femoral side or the pelvic, pelvic side. And eight years old, there's poor evidence for what to do, and mainly in a salvage scenario, so whether or not you do those valgus osteotomies or on shelves, etc. Um, there's no real, uh, there's no real consensus in the literature as to exactly what we should be doing with them. Thanks.